uh, worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but also as we celebrate mothers. And so let me say to this, all the wonderful mothers that are in the house, a uh, happy Mother's Day. I pray that you've already had a wonderful morning. I hope that you got breakfast in bed and your feet's already been rubbed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, you got the house clean for you and you've done the laundry this morning. I know all that's done already today, so you can rest this afternoon. Amen.
clean them fish and put them in the freezer and save them up. And we won't have to buy quite as many uh, 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 catfish and mullet when we get ready for that. But come and be with us if you can and sign up so we know how many are coming. We won't have enough, we won't have enough fish for everybody. Uh, that would be great as well. So we look forward to all of these opportunities of fellowship uh, and being in the house of God. We will ask you to come uh, and to be with us. Amen. If you're able to now at this time, let's stand up all over the house today. Again, we're so glad to see you in the house of the Lord this beautiful Mother's Day. And we just want to open up our service today with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege to be in your house today, to, to send praises unto your holy name, for truly you are worthy this morning. And Lord, we want to give special thanks now. Thanks for every mother, every mother that is here, and maybe God, mothers that have gone on, Lord, to be with you in heaven. God, thank you, Lord, for their legacy, for their love, for their, uh, God, uh, direction and comfort and discipline and all of the wonderful things that they have been God had done for us, Lord, and I just thank you, Father, for all that you use uh, uh, mothers to do, God, and I thank you for strengthening their hands and blessing them, God, God, to carry out their responsibilities, and God, now as we honor you and honor them today, we ask that you bless these services, God, may your anointing flow in this house today, Holy Ghost, move in a mighty way, but there's one coming with a burden, God, one come in uh, just heavy laden, God, with doubt or worry on their mind. I pray, God, that they would lay that burden down at the foot of the cross this morning and walk out of here differently when they came. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Let's sing this song together, amen. It's called, I Have a
here Sunday morning, Sunday night, a few few weeks ago. I felt led to pray for the women of the church. And you deal with issues that men completely cannot and do not understand. And all the ladies said, amen. amen. We admit that, amen. There are some things, I see y'all rolling your eyes. Right there. there are some things that men completely do not understand. There are certain burdens that, 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 that you carry. That, that we, we don't understand, we can't, can't comprehend, and we probably surely couldn't do it to, if we had to bear it. Amen. amen. But you know what? I want to say this to you mothers that are in here today. You ladies, amen. I don't know what you might be carrying today. I don't know what kind of load you may be carrying. I don't know how, how difficult your life situation may be right now. Let me tell you something to remind you. You've got an anchor, amen, that will keep you through the storms of life, amen. Through the difficulty of life, no, no matter how hard the winds may blow, how difficult it may get in, in the family and the turmoil and the kids is here and there and there's trouble there and trouble at work or whatever the case may be. Mother, let me encourage you, call on that sweet name of Jesus today. He is a sure foundation. He is an anchor and one that can keep you through the storms of life. Aren't you glad today? Come on, give the Lord some praise. <laughs> Let's sing that chorus one more time. Can we sing that chorus one more time? Now I have a
it's actually, um, they've made a song of all of the words that mothers say throughout the day, and they fit it into one song, and I found it kind of funny myself. I think you might too.
the very first gender, was able to declare Jesus was alive. Do you know that it was a woman, amen? That it was a woman who was at the empty tomb first while the men were still in bed, amen? And uh, the Bible says, uh, told Mary, said, you go and tell Peter that I'm alive. Amen. They had the opportunity to, to preach and to tell Jesus was alive. Ladies, the Bible says that in the last days uh, that there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and you are not missed in that. Amen. It is for, for men and women. Uh, uh, it is for young and old and all between. Amen. So I'm so thankful for uh, his anointing. I'm so thankful for his anointing on men and women. I'm so thankful for his anointing on Sister Nikki. And uh, I'm excited for her to come and share this word with you today. And so can you put your hands together and make her welcome. I want to pray over her. Amen. And so I want to ask you to do something. You just stretch your hands out this way as we pray for her this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we are ever grateful of your grace and your mercy on our lives. God, I thank you, Lord, for our church. I thank you for the, the, the ministry workers of this church, including Sister Nikki Stone. I thank you, Father, for her faithfulness to serve you, to serve you faithfully in her personal life, to serve her, you personally uh, on her, the public stage. And in this church, God, I ask for your blessing to be upon her, you to bless her abundantly, God, everything that she touches, that you may multiply it, God, that God, that the kingdom may grow because of the work that she's doing right here in our church, God, we ask God for your uh, touch upon her as she is a wife, she is a mother of four children, God, that you bless her with strength, God, when she's tired, God, undergird her, Lord, and lift her up, God, when she's uh, doubtful, God, just give Give her comfort, God. Give her peace and rest. And in those times, and oh, God, fill her, Lord, also with your joy, God. Lord, now anoint her this morning, we pray, as she shares this word, God, unto us and to these mothers. Father, may they be impacted. May they be encouraged, not simply by her, but by the anointing and by your word that will go forth this morning, and it shall not return void. Lord, we love you. We thank you in your mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And amen. Okay, well, that's making me really nervous. <laughs> so when I get nervous when I'm singing, I close my eyes. But I don't think that's going to work too good with trying to speak to you this morning. But I'm thankful uh, to be here this morning. And, and I've titled my message, Running with God. And um, as you can tell, I'm not much of a runner. Um, Sister Laney and I were joking the other day that if you were ever to see one of us running, it'd be a good idea for you to run too, because it's not something, but there's probably something pretty bad behind us. But um, I use the word running today, running with God, because that word is used so often in motherhood, whether it's running errands or running late, you're running fast, maybe the baby's running a fever, or your teenagers are running with the wrong crowd. Um, you're running out of patience, you're running out of options, you're running behind on bills, or simply running out of steam. I want you to know that you're not alone, and I want to share the stories of some of the women in Scripture uh, to encourage you today while you run with God. Our opening Scripture, Amanda, if you don't mind putting it up there, is Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, eagles, uh, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You wouldn't pray with me. My Father, I come before you in complete confidence of your sovereignty and your ability. I am fully aware that you opened this door and invited me in, and you, Lord of Lords, put a word on my heart to share with these women. No one is here by accident. Nothing is random or coincidental. Throughout the ages, men like Abraham, Moses, and Elijah climbed mountains to meet with you. But you came and met the women where they were. You journeyed to a well that was out of your way just to speak to an unworthy woman. You went to the home Mary and Martha. And even as an infant, you went to the temple so that Anna would see you promise fulfilled. Meet us here today, Lord. Let us see your promises fulfilled today. Let us sit at your feet, forgetting the hustle and bustle of life, and choose that good heart that will not be taken away from us. 
and let us evangelize the good news to all who we come in contact with. I'm simply one insignificant woman in a long line of insignificant women and imperfect women that found their life in you. I open myself to your anointing and ask that your Holy Spirit speak through me as you promised through the prophet Joel. My intention is to make your great name known. Help me, Holy Spirit, bless this service, the reading of your word, and all who are here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 If you think my prayer was long-winded, just wait for the message. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Julie spoke with me yesterday. She said that her and Jeff had to be out of town, but they were disappointed because they were actually going to get out of church on time this Sunday. So, so I'll do my best. I promise I'll do my best. Um, but the first word I want to tell you, I've got four four words um, to tell you. Um, and I was actually, I was with here, and we went to a, a Priscilla Shire conference, and I was so into her message and paying attention, and the Holy Spirit broke through everything that was going on in that room and gave me four words to scribble down on a piece of paper. And I wrote those words down, and those are the words that I want to share with you today. The first word is remembrance. Remembrance. Um, when I was growing up, the women in my life would tell me that when you have a baby, you forget all of the pain. You forget it all. You can't remember a thing. And I learned after my first child that that is a lie that women tell to get grandchildren. <laughs> because you do remember every bit of the pain. The thing is you understand that it's worth the pain. It's worth it. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord and they're a blessing. But the first word is remembrance. God does not forget. I want you to say that with me. God does not forget. Isaiah 49, 15, it says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. I love that the Lord used this analogy to describe his remembrance of us because it shows his understanding of women. Um, it, do you know how hard it is for a nursing mother to forget her baby? I've been one. So first of all, babies don't let you forget them. Babies cry. They make a lot of noise. And there's a certain term that we coined now because of those nursing babies that don't want to be separated from their mothers. Um, whether they're dry and happily fed, they are not content unless they're with their mom. Second of all, being a nursing mother, your body and your mind won't let you forget those children. Um, I remember when my babies were small, and I'm sure you do too, mamas, when you would just wake up in the middle of the night and look over just to see if they're still breathing. And you just look to see if their stomach's rising. And, and, um, and then those times that they would sleep past the, the, the scheduled feeding time, the time that I could actually sleep in and enjoy, but I couldn't because my body was so uncomfortable. Uh, those knots under my arm would wake me up, and I would have to wake up that baby to nurse them just to get relief. And so my body nor my mind would let me forget them. But God says that even if a nursing mother could forget their child, he won't forget you. And I think about Sarah when I think about um, that word remembrance. The enemy, he does a good job of making us feel forgotten by God. And Sarah, Sarah knew that Abraham was supposed to have a son. Sarah knew the promise that God had given Abraham. Um, but Sarah saw herself as not important to that point. She did not feel that she was useful or needed in that situation for that promise to come about. And this is just a word that the Lord spoke into my spirit. And I, I need you to hear this, that living under the false pretense that you were forgotten and unimportant to God's plans will lead you to put your calling on someone else who is not qualified or chosen by God to accomplish it. If you live under the false pretense that you are not important, Mama, you're not important, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, if you live under that false pretense, that lie that the enemy tells you, it will lead you, like Sarah did, to present your calling and your purpose and put it on somebody else. Hagar was not chosen by God to, to give birth to the promised son. But Sarah saw herself as unimportant, and she put Hagar in the way. Um... Although Sarah may have felt forgotten by God, she was not. In Genesis chapter 18, while God was on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember the two angels and, and the little word went, they were going to Sodom and Gomorrah to pronounce judgment. And on the way, they stopped by 
Abraham and Sarah's place. God is the busiest person. I take so much comfort knowing how busy God is. God is, there's so much going on. He's in control of all of it. And yet he's never in a hurry. He's never worried. He's never, you know, he was on his way to go complete a task and on his way to go do something monumental, he stopped by to see Abraham and Sarah. And so I take comfort in that, knowing that we don't have to be in a rush with everything that we're doing parents. But um, he stopped by to see uh, Sarah, and he said, he asked Abraham where she was. And he gave a timeline that he would be back within a year, and that within that year's time when he came back, Sarah would be holding her own baby in her arms, her own promise in her arms. In just a few chapters over, in verse uh, chapter 21 of Genesis, do you have that there? It says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, and I want you to look at this part, whom Sarah bore to him. Then I, Abraham circumcised his son when Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him, and Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Sarah was remembering God did not forget her. Did you see how many times her name was in that scripture? Six times Sarah's name was there. She had already taken herself out of the equation, presented Hagar, but God said, no, Sarah, this was your promise. If God has promised you something, really promised you something, not something you just wish for or you hope would happen, but if God has said something to you in your spirit and he's promised it to you, he's confirmed it through his word, it will come to be. It will come to be. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Um, your waiting is not in vain. There's an appointed time, and when that time is right, nothing will stop that promise from being fulfilled. But until that time, nothing you do will hurry it up. There is an appointed time for everything. So you must wait upon the Lord for your strength to be renewed so that you can run after the promise and not get weary. I think about Sarah being over 90 years old and chasing a toddler around. That was probably very unusual, but God equipped her. She was the happiest 90 year old running around that there was. And so God will equip you. If He promised you something, it will come to be. He will equip you for it, and you are not forgotten. The second word is reality. Reality. Believing in God does not exempt you from trauma. Believing in God does not exempt you from trauma. I know of two sisters, two, their granddaughters of a preacher, godly, godly heritage, love the Lord, and both of them had to mourn the loss of infant daughters within a couple of years of each other. It just blew my mind. Um, I know of a, a, a friend of mine, her daughter was in class with Emily in every grade in elementary school. And when she got to sixth grade, uh, at 12 years old, this, this young girl died of pulmonary hypertension. Suddenly, um, recently there was a little girl who was killed as a result of a drunk driver here locally. And I think about all that stuff, and the thought comes to mind that life is not fair. Yeah. Life is not fair, and as sympathetic and empathetic as I can be, having gone through a lot of loss in my own life, I've searched the scriptures, and nowhere have I found any semblance of a verse that says every little thing's going to be all right. It's not in there. Um, it's just not in there. That's what we want to believe, but it's not always all right. It, it's okay to not, not be all right. Um, Rizpah was not all right. Rizpah is a lady in the Bible. She was one of two wives of King Saul, and she was a great mother. And I can't prove that she was a great mother by her son's lives, but I can prove it by their death. Uh, we find their, same, their story in 2 Samuel chapter 21. And because of bad decisions made by their father Saul, Rizba's two sons and five others were put to death as a result of a political agreement. There was nothing that Rizba could do to save her sons. She was powerless 
And that powerless feeling accompanies every bereaved mother, the mother who miscarried and had no power to keep her child alive in her womb, the mother who could not cure the cancer or the sickness that took her child in spite of the anguished prayers and pleas that she offered up, the powerlessness of the mother who got the phone call that her child had been in a wreck and she could not say goodbye, the powerlessness of the mother whose child committed suicide and she couldn't prevent it, and the powerlessness of the mother whose child was murdered and she could not defend him. That was Rizpah. That powerlessness, though, soon, however, it turned to strength. Rizpah could not save the lives of her sons, but she defended their honor in death. She did not give up. After being executed, her sons were not given a proper burial. They were left hanging, and the Bible tells us that Rizpah spread out sackcloth on a rock, and she guarded the bodies of her sons for four to six months. Out in the elements, the rain, the wind, regardless of what happened, she was there spotting off the, the scavengers of wild animals um, just so that her, the bodies of her children would not be desecrated. This mother's love got the attention of everyone and prompted King David to intervene, and he gave them a proper burial. A mother's love does not give up. I don't know if y'all know that. The mother's love does not quit. It never gives up. The bereaved mother is entrusted with the precious pain of living for her children, keeping their memory alive, and fighting for them to be honored and respected and not forgotten. Although your reality may be traumatic beyond hers, just as King David actually allowed this, this situation to happen for Rizba, he also intervened at the end. Your Heavenly Father is involved in your reality. No matter how traumatic it may be, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalms 46. He's a very present help. He's not just somebody who's way away and you have to go to. He's there in the situation that you're facing. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And one day, we will see that these these painful, terrible things that we have faced, these health problems or these losses, whatever it is, they're going to be like momentary afflictions in light of eternity. The third word is relief. Relief, it will not always be this way. It will not always be this way. I'm reminded of a mother named Naomi. I know y'all know that story in the Bible. Naomi was also a bereaved mother, and in the book of Ruth, um, we find that she left her home with her husband and two sons, and they went to the land of Moab. Um, and in Moab, it was a land of idolatry, and she lost everything. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons. She was empty. She was absolutely empty. She was without hope. She was bitter, and she had no plans for the future. Her life was over. But there, in the middle of her loss, was a blessing in disguise named Ruth. And, you know, she was so bitter and she, she was so desperate that she didn't even see the blessing that Ruth was to her. She tried to turn the blessing away. She said, Ruth, I don't have anything for you. Just go back to your father's house. Go back. Find somebody else to marry. I've got nothing for you. But Ruth, I love that story. Um, Ruth said in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 4, I believe it is, it says, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death part you and me. Ruth, uh, <clears throat> Ruth's loyalty represents the love of God. And it makes me think of what the Apostle Paul said. In Romans 8, 38, 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your bitterness, your pain, your confusion, your anger, cannot separate you from the love of God any more than it can separate Naomi from Ruth. It's going to go with you wherever you go. And this is the conclusion of the story. Um, your, your Naomi 
had God's favor upon her life, and her end was better than her beginning. Right. Ruth 4, 17, 14 and 17, it says, The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. May his name be famous in Israel, and may he be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom, became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, This there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Where you are is not where you will always be. Your current situation, whether you're in a Moab and you're childless and you're broken and you're defeated, it's not where you're always going to be. You have a kinsman redeemer, and he's looking for you. He's out in the fields daily looking over, just looking to see if you've made it to the place you're supposed to be in. He has good plans for you, and they're plans to give you a hope and a future. And there's relief coming. It will not always be this way. And the final word is redemption. Redemption. God is in the restoration business. Can I get an amen? Okay. God is in the restoration business. That's what he specializes in. And there's one other woman that I want to mention um, as I close. Boy, that went a whole lot faster than it did when I practiced it. I forgot half of it. So we'll just go back through it, okay? We'll run back through it and, uh, and I'll get the points that I missed. Um, so, but there's one other woman I want to talk about, and that's the proverbial perfect woman in Proverbs chapter 31. Um, Y'all know her. She, she's clothed with strength and dignity, and, and she laughs without fear of the future, and, and her husband safely trusts in her, and her candle doesn't go out by night, blah, 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 blah. Like she, she's perfect, right? She's absolutely perfect. I'm not making light of it. She's, she's wonderful. Um, but there's such a standard that we hold ourselves to, and we admire this woman so much, and rightfully so, because she has it all together. I mean, she does. She has it all together. But just to shed a little light, I like to read between the lines, and I like to read on what's not being said sometimes. And so I want to share you, with you some things that are not said about her. It does not say that she was thin, that she was a size four. Okay? It does not say that anywhere in there. I read it. I read it. Um, it does not say that she had every hair in place and that it was uh, there were no braids visible. It does not say it. It does not say that her children liked or ate everything that she could. Uh -huh. Where, where's J.D. Uh, he's not in here. He's in the uh, they don't have to like what you got. Um, you know, it just said that she had food available for them and that they had jackets in the wintertime. I can, we can do that. We can do that. We can make sure there's something for them to eat, whether they like it or not. Um, it does not say that she had her nails done every two weeks. It does not say that she was never in a bad mood or that she was never sick. And here's a good one for you ladies. It doesn't say she never got a headache at night. Yeah. It doesn't say that. It does not say it. Not in there. So she was a trustworthy, hardworking, generous, wonderful woman. And that's the standard that we can live up to in Christ. That's the standard that we look to. Proverbs 31 was written by a man named Lemuel. And so I'm going to I'm gonna share this my way. You don't have to agree with me. I'm used to other people being wrong. I, I was brought up that way. It's okay. <laughs> but no, half the people, there, there's theologians that, that agree with me. There's theologians that don't. And so, but neither way, if, if you don't agree with me, it does not change the fact of the matter of the story. So, but Lemuel was... Um, the man that is writing in Proverbs 31, and he's telling us and teaching us something that his mother taught him. From my studies and from what I have gathered, Lemuel went by several names. In 2 Samuel 12, 25, he went by the name Jedidiah. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he went by the name the preacher. And in the book of Song of Psalms, he was known as the beloved. And we know him as King Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible. So here's the shocker for me when I got to thinking about all of that. Um, and just the most wonderful picture of God's redemption. Who was Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Now when I read Proverbs 31, Bathsheba is not the first name that comes to mind when I'm looking at all these wonderful attributes 
I mean, she's never crossed my mind when I read Proverbs 31. And it just, it amazes me because her name has always been equated with adultery and sexual sin. I've never equated it with Proverbs 31. Um, and this is the thing. Like, the Bible does not tell us in the story where we learn about David and Bathsheba. The Bible does not tell us if Bathsheba was an absolute victim and she had no choice and no, 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 no part of saying no in the matter. And she doesn't tell us if the Bible doesn't tell us if she enticed him, if she was out there on purpose. And so, and I've always wondered that. I've wondered, like, why, oh, Lord, you know, because we all tend to form our own opinions. And I'm like, well, why, Lord, was she out there on purpose? Was she trying to get his attention? Did she know that King David every afternoon was walking around out there? Did she do that? Or was she just absolutely a victim? And I prayed about it, and, and I asked the Lord, like, why don't you specify that? And the thought came to mind that um, he did that on purpose. And he did that on purpose because people are always going to think what they want to think, no matter what the truth is. And so I've learned that, that people are going to think whatever they want to think, and it doesn't matter if he specifies or not. And I've learned it, and it goes both ways because women, a lot of times, women... Um, who have been victimized tend to see her as being a victim that she had no role in the matter whatsoever. She could not help it. Women who have a bit of pride and self-righteousness tend to lean towards she brought that on herself. She must have been out there. She enticed him. She did something wrong. And the truth is the truth is that um, it doesn't matter how it happened because it happened. And so, so many times, ladies, we get hung up on the whys and the hows and everything. And the truth is it doesn't matter how it happened or why it happened because it just happened. And we have to deal with the aftermath. And if we get so stuck on what came first, we never get to the end part. We get so stuck on the adultery and the scandal that we never get to see the Proverbs 31. And so that's what I want us to look at today is that... Um, there was a price that she paid, regardless of whether it was her own fault, if she had any part to play in it whatsoever, there was a price that she had to pay. And um, her first baby, the baby she gave birth to, she nursed this baby. She looked at his face and she saw his own, her own features probably in his face. She counted his little fingers and toes and she looked at this child, her first baby ever, and that child was sentenced to death because of David's sin. She paid a great price. That's why David fasted and prayed this child's life was in a parallel to Jesus. His life was going to be required to pay for somebody else's sin. And Bathsheba, much like Mary, had to see her child pay a price for sin that he did not commit. Um, not only that, but... You know, not only was Bathsheba's reputation and character forever in question because of the scandal, but her baby died. And I can't imagine how alone she must have felt. And I don't know, maybe you've never been the topic of the discussion in gossip groups. And if you haven't, like, I am so happy for you. I, I'm so happy for you. Um, but don't get real comfortable because as far as I can tell, everybody gets a turn. Everybody gets a turn in the hot seat and you're going to get talked about and that's just the way it is um, because the only person who doesn't get talked about is the person who does nothing absolutely nothing and that's the only way you're not going to get talked about um, but not only was her reputation and everything and all the scandal um, going on but you know everybody gets a turn and it doesn't matter what the truth is just ask Joe just ask Joe um, even your friends those people that you think are friends you will find that times will continue and say, you deserve what's coming to you. You deserve what's happening to you. Um, and, you know, mothers, if you've got a way for child, you might have a church lady say, well, they must not have been, that, you know, they must not have been living at, at home like they, they profess at church. And the truth is, your adult children can do what they're, they're adults. They can make choices. They're going to make wrong choices just like I make wrong choices and you make wrong choices. Um, but... And this is the, the one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 3, 17. It says, God did not send his, world, his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. God did not send his son to condemn the Bathshebas and the Rahabs and, and the, the women who didn't do the right thing. He sent his son in here to save us, all of us. Um, God did not send his son into the world to condemn your children who were living in sin. I, I've heard so much preaching lately about, about homosexuals and transgenders and, and furries and all this stuff. And I'm going to tell you what, God did not send Jesus Christ into the world to condemn homosexuals or to condemn uh, transgender people or non-binary people. He didn't, not, he didn't send him to condemn them. He sent Jesus to save them. He loves them. Romans 5 says, while we, were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If your children are living in sin, he loves them. And he is here to save them. He is not here to condemn them. There is hope for them. And it's not your job to be the Holy Spirit to convict them. The Holy Spirit is very capable of doing his job. It is our job to pray and ask him to do his job and to watch him work. But the Lord specializes in restoration. He took Bathsheba's story and he made something beautiful out of it. He gave her beauty, her ashes. He turned her mourning into dancing. And joy really did come in the morning. Not only did Bathsheba have another son, but that son God chose to be the wisest king that we know of. He chose that son to build his temple. God turns things around. Good. And I want you to look at the respect that Solomon has for his mother. It's in 1 Kings 2.19. It says, Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her, and he bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. And he had a throne set for the king's mother, so she sat at his right hand. This woman Bathsheba, the people had talked about, that had criticized, that had lived under the scrutiny, because y'all, I'm telling you, people didn't just start talking and counting nine months now. They were counting way back then, too. They knew. She lived under all of this scrutiny. And yet, when her son is exalted, he exalts her, too. And you read the Proverbs and see how many Proverbs are written about mothers, how much respect that Solomon has for Bathsheba. And he even had a throne set for her to sit on that throne. And it makes me think of that verse in, in Psalms 23rd Psalm where it, you sit at a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All of those people who grumbled and talked about Bathsheba are now seeing her sitting on a throne beside her son. She has been elevated to a place of, of um, influence. God can turn your life around. He can turn the bad into the good. Um, he respected, Solomon respected his mother. He honored her. He was not ashamed of her based on her past or other people's opinion of her. And rightfully so. And how often do we misjudge the women that are sitting in this room? And we look around and we find ourselves judging their story, not knowing the whole story. We find ourselves looking at their kids and saying, well, they must not be up to talk. They must not be doing something right. Well, that's not true. Listen, Jesus had 12 followers, <laughs> and none of them stayed with him the whole time. John was the only one at the foot of the cross. If he couldn't keep 12 people with him, for us to think that we can make our children, you know, be perfect when we're imperfect ourselves, it's just, it's not going to happen. Regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in this morning, Moms, whether they're consequences of your own bad choices or something happened to you that you have no control over, God wants to restore you. He wants to use you to raise wise sons and daughters and to influence your future grandchildren for generations to come. This thought crossed my mind last night, and I wrote it down, that, that my children are the arrows that I'm going to shoot into a generation and a time that I will never see. And so that is what we're doing as mothers. We're not perfect. We're not going to get it right. But we're going to get them everything because of us and in spite of us. The Lord's going to use them to change future generations. And that's what, that's what our job is. But God wants to restore you. He wants to use you to raise wise sons and daughters to influence 
future generations. You matter to God. Mamas, you matter to God. If Sarah had not been part of the plan, that plan wouldn't have got off the ground very good. Sarah was instrumental in being Isaac's mama, in protecting him, in shaping Abraham's thought pattern of what Isaac was supposed to do. She was instrumental. You are instrumental in the lives of your children. God has chosen you, you, to be their parent. Um, just like Sarah did and put Hagar in the, in the situation, you have to be careful, mamas, not to put your calling of being a mother on somebody else. It's not your, it's not grandma's job to raise your children. It is not the teacher's job at school to teach your children everything they're supposed to know. It's not the, the Sunday school teacher's job to teach your children about Jesus. You are the one that God chose. In his infinite wisdom, he placed that child in your life for you to raise. And if you put other people in your place and don't fulfill your responsibility, just like you're, you're going to have a Hagar and an Ishmael in your life, it's going to be something that you're going to have to fight with. So do your job, Mama. God called you for it. He equipped you for it. Um, nothing can separate you from God's love. Just like Ruth would, could not be separated from Naomi, nothing can separate you from God's love. You are not forgotten like Sarah. Um, despite your reality, like Rizpah, he is an ever-present help. As with Naomi, nothing can separate you from his love. And like Bathsheba, he will give you beauty for your ashes. I'm going to ask y'all to stand, if you don't mind, and clear if you don't mind coming to me, if you don't. And if you were blessed with wonderful women in your life, I want you to bow your head, and I want you to just quietly begin to thank God for the wonderful, wonderful women that are in your life. And to the women, I want to open up the altar to you. You may be a Hannah, a Rachel, or a Sarah whose womb is empty. And maybe you want to entreat the Lord for a child. I invite you to come. You may be a Ruth who needs a husband. I invite you to come. You may be a single mother who, like the widow with the oil and the meal, whose provisions were about to run out. I invite you to come. You may be a Rahab living a lifestyle of sin. Or you might be the mother of a prodigal. Regardless, our Lord remedied every one of these situations. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did for them, he'll do for you. So I encourage you today to run to him so that you can run your race with endurance. Altars open. Mm -hmm.